And uh, Delegate Amprey, do you want to start with talking about the trip over to Oxford a few weeks ago? Sure, sure. Um, uh, thank you all so much for uh, uh, this time that we have together. Um, Oxford was amazing. Uh, it's actually my first time getting to travel to England and not be jumping to another country the next day or in a few hours. So um, the, I think one of the best parts is getting to soak up the culture and have an opportunity to uh, see how uh, not just um, the apprenticeship models work, but just kind of getting a, a sense of the culture of the country and the region. Um, had a great time uh, learning firsthand uh, from many of amazing speakers, which one we'll hear from today. Had the chance to to meet him while I was there. Um, I think, you know, I think one of the highlights of the trip, honestly, outside of sitting in a room and learning as much as possible, and um, I'm a nerd, so I love, you know, get, gaining as much information as I can on what we can try to replicate in Maryland, even though we're a little limited versus a country model versus state model. Uh, I think one of the highlights of the trip was definitely getting to speak firsthand with those who were actually going through the apprenticeship programming. So we had an opportunity to go to uh, the Mini Cooper factory um, and see firsthand the manufacturing systems and see how the, the apprenticeship models work there. But I would say one of the highlights of the trip was definitely getting the opportunity to go to the hospital and learn about the apprenticeship models that they have currently for nursing. Uh, that's something that I care deeply about is the roles that we have here in the States um, in Maryland where we're seeing a need, right? And we know that a barrier for that need is getting that degree and going to college and seeing how they're actually utilizing the apprenticeship model to fulfill some of the nursing needs that they have there uh, in the UK. And I got to meet firsthand some uh, individuals who are actually going through the apprenticeship process. Um, where there was someone who was started from the youth through the youth program, who was a young lady who actually learned early in her career in, in, in school that sitting in the classroom wasn't going to work for her to become a nurse one day. Just didn't, it wasn't that she didn't have the brains or the ability. She just, it just didn't work for her learning style, right? As a former teacher, I get it. Um, so she decided to do the apprenticeship program and she's on track to become a, a nurse there. And then I also was able to meet adults who made career switches who actually were working at the hospital as administrators. And because of the apprenticeship programs that they have there, they were able to actually start their apprenticeship at the hospital um, you know, again, getting paid, able to uh, continue being within the, I, I guess, pension system within the hospital, but then pivot into a new career in nursing. Um, so getting to learn about that process firsthand and then talk to the people who are doing it, uh, because I know that one of the, the things that stood out to me in learning about the UK, especially in comparison to Germany, which we'll talk about tomorrow, was just the culture of the concept of uh, going down the apprenticeship path versus the traditional college path with the apprenticeship degree programs they have in the UK and kind of the shift in the culture as far as what is considered, I don't want to use the word prestigious or what's considered normal. Um, and I, I think the, the, the approach to um, getting more young people uh, to understand that, you know, going down the apprenticeship path um, often means the trades here in the states, but the apprenticeship paths in the UK were a little different. They have nursing, they have teaching, etc. So, I think the cultural component of it all was an interesting thing to learn mm -hmm. about, and seeing that the some of the dips and ups and downs in the apprenticeship people entering their apprenticeship models is interesting. And then I would just say, lastly, uh, just you know, understanding. And I'm the I was going through some of the slides yesterday to recollect my memory, and just seeing how many uh, programs that were put in place to encourage their apprenticeships uh, through the UK model, uh, particularly the levy system, um, which is their taxing system to make sure that people, companies are paying into it and that you can withdraw from it to pay people in, into the apprenticeship models. So figuring out how we can make that work in Maryland is, you know, going to be a, a, a taxing prob, taxing issue, pun intended, but, you know, trying to figure out how we how we make that work. So. Um, again, the, my time in the UK was wonderful. I, I don't want to. I don't want to steal too much thunder from the presentation today. Um, but I would say that you know one of the biggest things I learned there, uh, or or the most encouraging thing I learned there, is just what does it look like and how do we engage individuals to be excited about going down the apprenticeship path um, and instilling that encouragement and keeping that going. Because once we set all this up and we have a greater apprenticeship metric models getting young people and people who want to pivot careers to stay in it and want to do it is going to be critical 
for us to sustain funding and sustain the program. And so understanding the cultural uh, component of it all was really interesting and, and getting to talk to people who are actually doing it was important. But again, overall, great trip. Um, so much more I can talk about, uh, but, but that's what comes to mind as far as just uh, getting some understanding. And, and I, I also had the cool, one of the other coolest parts was getting to sit down and learn all this in a building bit built in 1087. So that was also the highlight, like a building built almost a thousand years before I was born, I was learning in. So amazing. You're on mute, Sarah. Yeah. Tried to take my mute off because of noise back here. Thank you so much, Delegate Amprey, for talking about that. And it seemed like a really great experience you had. Um, so that's fantastic, the enthusiasm. And I'd like to turn it over to, I think we're going to go with Sophie next. Um, Sophie Smith is actually working with apprentices in the United Kingdom, um, and or her organization does. And so she's going to talk through what she does and how we might apply some of it to Maryland. Sophie? Okay, cool. So when I caught up with Sarah, she was just asking for a generalist, what I kind of do as my job, which is um, I work as a director in a training company. So we are a business that delivers apprenticeships to learners. Now, typically, um, we obviously have, I'm unsure on how much you guys are familiar with, but the programs are all standardized. Then these are kind of published and then businesses like Apprentify will then write the training programs and we then deliver them to our learners as well. So my job is to go out and meet with businesses and their employees to talk to them about what opportunities apprentices are. So it, what uh, opportunities apprenticeships give. So it's funny that you mentioned that a lot of the apprenticeship understanding in the states is about trades whilst that's not the case here in uh, the UK there's still a lot around uh, there's still a lot of misperception around what they actually involve so a lot of the time I'm liaising with businesses to find out how they are engaging with their staff their problems around maybe retention driving diversity into the business looking at uh, succession paths and how they building a talent pool how they want to kind of grow junior talent from within rather than always going for experienced people so when I'm out talking to L&D teams and managers and directors about their businesses we then look at where these gaps are where their people problems are where their challenges are and then we try and align how apprenticeships can help solve those problems so it's not just about it's not always just about training people up it's about the wider problems that businesses face that they can solve um, and also then there's brilliant opportunities that um, come from within so we have one learner who had two young children and two children in her 20s she never thought she'd be able to have a structured career. So actually having um, an apprenticeship while working, she was able to develop a career in marketing in her 30s with two young children at home and she couldn't go back into a, the education system um, in a straightforward manner. So it's about businesses creating opportunity for people within them whilst also solving lots of the different nuances that come from hiring people in terms of development and skill gaps and focus on that succession planning um, in their businesses too. So I kind of work within our commercial sales team, um, focusing on uh, how we help our clients understand the levy um, and help their employees understand what it means to be an apprentice as well. So I suppose in a summary, in a nutshell, that's what we are offering um, and how I go about my day job. Um, so yeah, I think that Sarah was the type of thing you were after. Yes, I think that was very helpful. Um, is there anything else that you think might just be useful for commission members with respect to apprentices um, and how the roles are there? Um, so I think something to highlight is that over half, and I'm sure Tom knows all the stats on this because he is very well versed on apprenticeships more so than I am, but over half of apprenticeship apprentices are existing employees. So people also automatically think they are about junior new people coming into um, into the workplace, but that's not always the case. It can often be someone that's changed direction or someone in the business who, for example, data. So data is a massive thing now. Almost every department 
is touching and handling data in some shape or form, but what our business is doing to train people up on how to utilize, utilize that data um, and how to kind of get meaning from it, to clean it, to understand it and interpret it easily and efficiently. So what apprenticeships are enabling businesses to do is to kind of access this funding to train people up in their business on areas that are growing and are important, but maybe they aren't fully skilled in on that area. So just be open-minded that we aren't, only talking about new hires here the kind of greater benefit is actually accessing people who are already in employment but maybe haven't been developed or there's room to drive um, skill development in their current roles thank you sophie and um unless is i think it might be easiest if we should go to tom next to speak um and he's going to give an overall background and then if we can direct question we can have commission members ask questions does that work for everybody Great. Sounds good. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody from a, a rainy old England. Uh, I think it's still morning for you on the East Coast, but uh, it uh, it looks um, quite biblical here at the moment. So hopefully my internet connection will will hold up. And it's great to follow um, Sophie. Um, and it's great also to see, um, obviously, Delegate Ampri, you were here in Oxford. I've still got my uh, Oxford University mug. There you go. Um, it was a very good trip. It's good to see you, uh, Sarah. I think Anne um, as well from the university. And there's several other names, actually, uh, that I recognise from, from your time in Oxford. And, of course, uh, it would be very remiss of me without mentioning um, my sort of fellow uh, apprenticeship partner in crime, Senator Rosa Pep, who uh, uh, I think if there was a Nobel Prize for uh, resilience and just banging the apprenticeship drum on uh, your side of the Atlantic, uh, uh, Senator Rosa Pett would be a prime candidate for that. And indeed, on a day when I think you've uh, made history with the first centurion president of the United States. So happy birthday to President Carter as well. Um, look, I mean, I, I, I think really there's just two or three points I just wanted to highlight without, without sort of repeating uh, the presentation uh, that I gave a couple of weeks ago in Oxford. Um, and in part, these comments are driven by the fact that, you know, obviously having had many a conversation with Senator Rosa Pepp over the years and also read uh, some of the material that the Commission itself has written, has produced. I mean, I'm very aware that you have uh, an ambition uh, for 40 percent of your upper secondary cohort uh, in the future going down a work based um, learn and earn uh, apprenticeship route. And I just really want to highlight why that's a very sensible policy, not least because having myself looked into some of the data recently on uh, returns to high school diplomas in the US. Alas, this is data for the US, not not for Maryland. But, uh, you know, what's I think fascinating about the data is um, really up until about 2010, there was a very, very clear distinction between uh, returns over a working lifetime. These are wage uh, returns. Uh, for those who go down the four-year college route, vis-a-vis -vis those who don't go down the four-year college route and perhaps finish their level of education at uh, high school level. Actually, since 2010, um, what we've seen in the US is those that leave school actually with very good high school diplomas increasingly are um, outmatching uh, the wages of those who have gone to not all, but some certain courses and certain four year colleges. In other words, I mean, we kind of know this intuitively, right? Um, not not all bachelors are created uh, equal, uh, as it were. Uh, and that is now um, uh, really manifesting itself in the US labor market, as indeed it is here on this side of the pond, where, you know, the data that we've looked at in terms of um, uh, tax returns, you know, and what people are paying, because we can track our students from the institutions and the courses. And then when they join the labour force, because they have to pay back their student loans via the payroll system, we've got very, very rich data now on uh, the returns from courses. And, uh, you know, just in headline terms, we're seeing about a fifth of our graduates now are in non-graduate jobs. In other words, they're in graduate, you know, they're in jobs that don't pay graduate wages and, and in fact there are some courses now uh, where you know it would have been better off if they just left school uh, with their A-levels not taken on the student debt not uh, gone to university for three years um, so so you know I think that's a dynamic that is only going to increase on both sides of the Atlantic and 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 therefore I think you can see why the commission wants to find better ways of 
not just moving away from what you might call this educational monoculture. You know, I think uh, Delicate Ampere referred to this in terms of you know success being purely defined by uh, a four-year college degree. I think I, uh, I read an article recently by one of your think tank uh, people who talked about opportunity pluralism uh, in the US, and I, and I would wholeheartedly agree with that. We want to create many routes to success, uh, not just define success purely in academic terms. So, you know, there isn't a single advanced country around the world that isn't trying to figure out uh, how best to um, repair what you might call, you know, the broken bridge, really. And, and what I mean by this, the broken bridge is the transmission mechanism from upper secondary education into um, the workforce. And it's been obviously broken for quite some time and, and also for particular groups, the marginalised groups, for those that haven't maybe gone through uh, the four year college route. So that's why I think, you know, this idea of trying to build um, more effective pathways from your upper secondary education system into the labour force is absolutely the right way to go. Um, Sophie will know this because she's, um, you know, part of the uh, the English skills system. And, and, and you, you know, I frankly take my hat off to her because she has to deal with a lot of changes. Uh, some of them are welcome, some of them not so welcome, but of course we've just had a new government here that is talking very much about reorientating uh, the English apprenticeship model back towards younger people. Sophie mentioned the fact that about a third actually of our apprentices are over the age of 30. Nothing wrong with that. We have an all age, all levels apprenticeship model. Uh, about half are uh, employed in um, uh, uh, already within their companies. Um, and actually, in terms of cohort size, this might be useful for you to know as commission members, around about 2% of our 16 to 19 year olds are in apprenticeship, so quite a low figure, um, but that's a reduction of about 70% overall for that, for that cohort since about 2015. So we've seen actually the collapse of youth apprenticeships uh, in Britain in the last um, the last few years. The, I'll, I'll go into, in the discussion, I'll go into reasons why that happened. There's not a single reason, but there's a combination of reasons why that happened. Um, and, uh, you know, overall, we've seen about a 38% reduction in the number of under 25. So the English apprenticeship model has been moving to, to an older, uh, to those more in work. And increasingly, actually, when we look at the new starts, uh, the new apprenticeship starts uh, in our in our model. Um, uh, you know, we're seeing a real growth, which I think, by the way, is a positive thing. But we are seeing a real growth in these degree level apprenticeships, which uh, Delegate Ambry uh, also uh, referred to. You know, we've got a new government. I mean, just briefly, and then I'll I'll shut up. Um, just briefly, in terms of the 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 um, uh, the plans of the new government, in terms of what we know, uh, there is a commitment to. Uh, create what are called foundation apprenticeships for young people. So, you know, they do want to increase the number of younger people who from the upper secondary system are going down the uh, work-based learning and earning route. Quite how they do that, they haven't announced the how of that. I mean, Sophie will have her views on the extent to which, you know, employers will engage with that kind of initiative um, in terms of taking on young people. It'd be interesting to see whether they go down some kind of wage subsidy route for, for younger people. They certainly did that during the pandemic, didn't they, Sophie, when they offered additional monies to providers, to uh, employers, if they took on young people. So I think wage subsidy is an interesting model. Um, and also there's this kind of commitment to um, uh, really uh, create and invest in technical colleges. So, you know, the, the equivalent in the US, obviously in Maryland, is the community college uh, system. Uh, in order to help deliver on what they're calling a youth guarantee. So in conclusion, where the you know, this new government, this new Labour government, uh, centre-left uh, government here in the UK wants to go, is effectively get to a situation where we have a, a, a compulsory school leaving age, um, college leaving age at 18, uh, but that no young person then becomes unemployed or in the jargon neat, not in education, employment and training. We do have 900,000 uh, under 24 year olds who are not in education, employment and training at the moment. What the uh, Labour government wants to do is, is, is create what they're calling a youth guarantee, which is an interesting concept. It's the idea of actually, you know, guaranteeing effectively 
uh, further education, training or apprenticeships for for that age group. And I could say more about that because we have had, by the way, these youth guarantees in the past um, and there are pros and cons with them from a policy perspective. But I could I can say more if you want in the discussion about how how those youth guarantees um, uh, work in the labour market. Hope that's useful, Sarah. Sorry if I rambled on. No, I was thinking it was fantastic. Um, and just FYI, I haven't actually shared your spread, your presentation slides from Oxford yet because I was I didn't want to steal any thunder in case you were going to use those today. Um, so that's basically the introduction, and this is an opportunity for commission members to um, ask questions to learn more about any of the th things that are talked about. Or um, I don't know if Dr. Cotton, if you would like to, you were also on the trip, and if you had anything you wanted to share after that or a spur to a question. I don't have any additional questions. I, I agree with the delegate. The trip was very beneficial. I think some of the things that are most important relative to Maryland are the opportunities for the de degree apprenticeships, especially as they relate to healthcare and the opportunities we have in healthcare here. I thought that was an important model. And I think that our visit to the hospital really showed how that was, how beneficial that was. And I also, the career progression, I thought was really beneficial for apprenticeships for people who are in career service. And let's start our questions with Sarah. Hi, excuse me, I'm driving to another meeting in the car, but I have a quick question. Um, I actually studied for a little bit in Scotland uh, for law school, and I know that there were apprenticeable, a lot of the law students were apprentices but they were also in those four-year colleges and degree programs. Can you speak a little bit to that model, if you're aware of it, just to kind of, you know, because I think that it is important to have our students that are in colleges and universities and grad schools, but how we can reflect that model to have them also be apprentices at the same time, because there is a disconnect between the two. Yeah. I mean, just as a general point, I mean, as you know, um, uh, you know, doctors, lawyers, I mean, they've been, in a sense, apprentices for years. They just don't call themselves that, right? I mean, it's a vocational uh, qualification um, that they get. Um, but uh, in the UK, um, you know, when we talk about apprenticeship, and I obviously covered this in my presentation at Oxford as well, I, you know, I, I made the point that we do legally protect uh, the term apprenticeship. Uh, you, you know, a company... Um, an organization cannot just launch an apprenticeship scheme in Maryland or anywhere else and say, you know, um, come and do our law apprenticeship uh, unless it's formally recognized by the state. And and that might be, by the way, something that, you know, as legislators on this call, because it's a relatively cost free uh, policy option, actually, if you think about it in terms of protecting legally um, that name in um in Maryland, although of course, as part of the legislation, you'd have to define more clearly what was meant um, about the term apprenticeship. In Scotland, they call uh, in England they're called degree apprenticeships. Scotland has its own. In fact, you know the UK is really has four systems of apprenticeship, just like uh, in the states. You've got effectively fifty state uh, apprenticeship models as well as the federal registered apprenticeship model. Um, and you know, I mean, in some ways, actually, it's kind of fully devolved here. Scotland has these graduate apprenticeships. They um, they fund this from the levy. I mean, would it be helpful, Sarah, to say a bit more about um, how apprentices are financed? Because that's obviously a key driver here. Um, so how it works, uh, all all UK companies with a I'm going to just do a, a very rough uh, conversion to dollars for you. So all UK companies registered in the United Kingdom with payrolls of above four million dollars have to pay. 0.5% of that payroll into what's called the national levy pot, which is collected by our friends in the equivalent of your IRS, uh, our friends in the Treasury, uh, or the um, uh, His Majesty's Revenue and Customs, as it's known. Uh, and the way it works because of our equivalent, I mean, it's a quasi-federal country these days, what the Treasury then does is it gives um, £3 billion pounds uh, to uh, England and and um, then you know the other billion shared between Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Now, how it works in England is uh, because all the rhetoric around the levy is okay, guys, you paid this tax into the pot, zero point five percent of your 
um, payroll, you can get that money back plus 10% <laughs> if you take on apprentices. So that's how the, that's how the marketing of it works uh, in England. And um, effectively what each employer, and not just by the way, the, the employers that pay the levy, but the, the, the 98% of employers that actually don't have to pay the levy because they don't have payrolls that, that large. Um, in England, they have what's called a digital apprenticeship account. So with that account, you can use that money and so you can say a bit more actually about if you want to say about the mechanics of how it works with the independent training providers and the community colleges but effectively in England that is money then uh, that the um, employers have to spend on apprenticeships and they can spend that money on any one of I mean Sophie's it's over 600 standards now isn't it it's uh, north, of, north of 600 apprenticeship standards and those standards range from the equivalent of an apprenticeship, say in uh, you know a dental assistant might be at level three, which is you know sort of eighteen year old A level high school diploma sort of equivalent level, right up to um, you know these nursing apprenticeships, which are associate degree and even uh, degree level. Um, so that's how the sort of financing of it works. And in and in Scotland, what they've decided to do is they don't devolve the funding to the employers through these digital accounts that they can go and sort of spend then with regulated uh, training providers. They just um, provide that directly. You know, they contract with a, a, effectively the, um, the college or the training provider directly. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's a, it can, it sounds quite complicated the model the way I've, sort of described it, but I think it's actually relatively straightforward in terms of how it works. And uh, one addition to that, uh, Tom, is if I'm correct, the funds can only be spent on the training portion, that fund, the funds can't be spent on any of the salary portion. Yeah, I mean, it's a, <laughs> if anyone has worked, um, and Sophie, please chip in, because I mean, you know, you know the system really, because you're up front every day working with employers with apprentices. Um, but yeah, you know, there are these funding rules that effectively mean that the the levy can only be spent on two things. One is the off job training, which, you know, Apprentify, for example, will be delivering in a number of different occupational areas. Um, and the other aspect that the levy can be used for to get spent on is what's called the endpoint assessment. So, again, this is another feature of uh, what I called Oxford because I, I felt I need to put a concept around it because I was at this um, amazing academic institution. I described, you know, the English system as a managed market ecosystem. In other words, you know, we, you know, we have quite a bit of regulation around the apprenticeship model. I mean, you do too, by the way, both, you know, federal level and the state level. But uh, the way, um, you know, we decided to to regulate things here in the uh, in England is not only protect the name, uh, but also every apprentice that goes through one of Sophie's or one of a whole number of different programs. Uh, they have to, um, you know, this is the apprentice, has to, uh, in effect, um, go through a, um, an end of term exam, if you want to use the, you know, the academic terminology. In other words, once they've, uh, you know, the employer and the provider feels that the individual is at a level of competence, I think they, they still call it threshold competence. But anyway, um, you know, this is the, there's, there's a whole terminology in the safety around this. Um, but they go through then to the endpoint assessment organisation, which is independent of the providers that gives the final sort of stamp of approval. Have I, have I explained that correctly, Sophie? Yeah, so programs are all a minimum of 13 months long, depending on what the program is. And they actually start from level two. Um, there it's must be level point. ones out there, but typically they can start at very junior levels right the way through to uh, level sevens. And they will vary in the length depending on the program. When they get to the end, so I suppose, Throughout the life of their apprenticeship, they will be consolidating work, working on portfolios in the workplace. So, for example, they might do a module on content creation and marketing. So they will be applying that in their role where they're doing a bit of content creation in their role. They will then add that into their as evidence of what they're learning. They get to the end of the apprenticeship and then they go into kind of a gateway where they work on this endpoint assessment piece. So that might be a presentation, an essay, portfolio of work. It might be a professional discussion they're preparing for. So you're gathering all that information to evidence all of the learning that you've had. And then you go into the final assessment piece, which is, Tom has highlighted, is with an external assessor who will expect to see 
what the final outcome is um, and then they can get a pass a merit or a distinction now interestingly with apprenticeships um, you can also weave in a number of different programs and certifications as well so for example we have a marketing program that also has a diploma by the from the chartered institute of marketing weaved within it so while you're covering your standard apprenticeship content you can also tick off modules for other programs as well so learners are going to come out with more than one qualification at the end of it um, sometimes that's free sometimes there's an additional cost that a bit that a, a business would kind of contribute towards a part of their development so um yeah that's how it works and then the levy Tom was kind of spot on. If you are over a certain, your annual salary bill is over a certain amount, you contribute the 0.5%. That goes into a pot, which is managed through a central system. Apprenticeship providers then draw down that funding monthly. If you said ABC Limited had one apprentice on a program each month while they're still on that program, Apprentify as the training provider, draw down that funding um, monthly. So it's in our interest to ensure these, appren these apprentices um, are successful and complete because if someone leaves halfway through, we don't secure the funding to the end of the programme. So there is an incentive for us to ensure there's quality to training delivered, learners are engaged and we support them through. Um, they also have ongoing coaching provided by us with kind of a learning mentor uh, throughout as well as part of that journey. And then for businesses who are too, who are smaller and don't reach that minimum salary threshold, you imagine the really large employers like the NHS, for example, paying you know hundreds of thousands and thousands of pounds into this fund they can't physically spend it fast enough to train people up so what's left over goes into a reserve fund for then the SME space who are um, who don't pay that levy tax to then draw down funding in exactly the same way and they access 95 percent funded programs they contribute a five percent towards um, the training course basically Thank you so much for bo both of you for that. Um, Donna, would you like to ask your question? Yes, hi. Um, thank you for that. Sophie, I think I kind of followed it, but right now it, it looks like a bunch of circles on my page here. So I want to go back to Tom. Tom, you were talking about the decrease that you're experiencing with youth apprenticeship and also with people under 25. What is going on there? What's what's the percentage that you have of uh, students, um, and what's the percentage of under twenty five? Yeah. So, in a nutshell, and Sophie might disagree with me on this, by the way, because there's a very healthy debate about why um, apprenticeship numbers for young people have, have plummeted really uh, in England over the last uh, six or seven years. Um, I mean, it, it's not one thing, um, but it's a it's a classic case in my view, you know, someone that's a policy analyst, right, um, and has been a policy maker, I think it's the unintended uh, consequences of policy in the upper secondary education track. And let me just unpack that a bit. So, you know, the government, obviously, under, well, under successive political administrations, has always been very supportive of apprenticeships, full stop. It's, you know, it's not, not really a political battleground as to whether we should have apprenticeships, whether we should fund them. Even the levy actually is across the aisle consensus. It needs to be paid for and employers should be paying into the system. So that's, I think, you know, a big, a big plus for the policy. Where it's all got very, very uh, murky in, in more recent years is that um, you know, the government decided back in 2016, this is the last government, Conservative government, that they wanted to create from the age of 16 onwards. Um, so, you know, the upper secondary track of English education, they wanted to create a whole new um, part of the curriculum called T-levels or technical levels. These are full-time study-based programs that's, that effectively the community colleges deliver. In fact, actually, I think um, it is still the case, Sophie, independent training providers do not deliver T-levels. They're actually excluded from delivering these T-levels, which again tells you something about the policy in terms of getting money to the community colleges rather than money more broadly to those who maybe might be just as well equipped to deliver uh, that particular type of training. So these T-levels for 16 to 19 year olds, which are full-time study-based programs, they have a 45 day work placement and they are in occupational areas. They're in about 23 different occupational areas ranging from healthcare, health and social care, to construction, to digital. So, you know, the thinking behind the policy was, 
you know, we roughly seem to do well for 50% of our cohort. That's the cohort that goes on to university. Uh, historically, we've done very poorly by the other 50%. So the thinking in the Department for Education was, OK, we've got 50% going through to university. We won't bother them too much. That that seems to work. And what we'll do is we'll create these T-level tracks, technical level tracks for these other 50%. Now, that was the policy ambition. The trouble is here we are five years on, and not only has it resulted in a in a reduction in the numbers going into paid youth apprenticeship, but it's actually caused a big problem, a big logjam, because the young people themselves, on the basis of current evidence, don't want to do these T-levels. There's only 3% of the cohort that's opting for them. They want to do other vocational and technical qualifications that have been around for years, but the government wants to switch off the funding to those qualifications, almost trying to doom to success the T-level, my slightly opinionated account of what's going on. But I mean, so as you know, there's a massive review now going on under Professor Becky Francis, uh, who I'm in touch with, uh, about the future of this upper secondary track. But I suppose in a nutshell, it's a lesson for, for, for policymakers worldwide about whenever you're doing things in that upper secondary track of your education system, you need to be A, absolutely crystal clear why you're doing it, B, uh, that you've got the support of the students, the parents and the employers, importantly, uh, and C, you've got a proper infrastructure and the resources behind trying to deliver it. And what's kind of happened in England with this, you know, essentially whole new policy track trying to coexist alongside a previously successful youth apprenticeship track is the two have just have just clashed each other. Don, I hope that uh, answers your question or fills in some of the gaps, but um, that's my assessment. I, well, let me let me ask you more about that. So you're saying, and I I'm I tried to do it, um, that you have a few dozen T level specific curriculum for sixteen to nineteen. Yeah. Okay, and what percentage of the students participate in those? At the moment, only three percent. But but the original policy ambition was that fifty percent of the cohort, so you know, ten percent more than your cohort, they wanted to go into the occupational technical level track. So the before you did this, what hmm. what did you offer for the sixteen to nineteen year olds? Well, what was interesting is, um, <laughs> you know, this was never a, a particular objective of policy, but what actually happened and, and, and is still the case now is, you know, we we allow our 16 um, to 19 year olds to take a combination of academic and vocational courses. So for those, for example, that, you know, are destined to Oxford University, they've got to really take three A levels, advanced levels and get A star uh, grades if they want to stand a chance of getting into Oxford. However, you know, we've got 140 other universities in this country, some of whom were like old polytechnics, so they were quite work based in terms of their uh, even their academic uh, approach. So what started to happen is that you know, we have these um, they're called awarding bodies in the United Kingdom. They're independent bodies of government that all essentially develop credentials. Some of them you may have heard of, like City and Guilds or Pearson. Uh, it's quite a huge company in this space but effectively um what the government allowed to happen was for schools colleges six forms you know those in the upper secondary track to offer a combination of academic qualifications with vocational qualifications and then the rest really was left to student choice St you know, students that really love study-based academic programs or culturally they were not or culturally i mean when i look back we had you leave school at 16 and then you either went on to college to do these A-levels that Tom's mentioned, um, or there are a few alternative options still delivered by the college, or you started work was the kind of other route. Then you do your two years at college until you're 18, 19, and then you go on to university for three years. But it's really that gap where I had some friends that went straight into retail and kind of low-level office jobs as an option, or you went down the university route. And some of that is um and i think i suppose the beauty of apprenticeships is that you're able to tap into that market where my mum was an academic so when you're grown when you're kind of brought up in the environment that i naturally i was always going to go to uni I that was just the route 
that was installed in me. But for some people who don't have that or don't have the privilege of, you know, some people have to go to work to help feed the family and start contributing to the home and the schools weren't forcing them to stay in then they would start working at a younger age and wouldn't always have the opportunity so now apprenticeships would enable somebody in the workplace to earn and learn at the same time and tries to encourage that upskilling nationally of people in those junior type kind of that age bracket really I think too from a business perspective when I'm out talking to businesses there is still some hesitancy around hiring 16 year olds for professional roles so I work in data IT sales and marketing apprenticeships and sometimes they will put a minimum I want an 18 year old you know in our country that's when you're an adult you can start drinking alcohol you haven't got the safeguarding issues that you have if you hire 16 year olds yet i've got another client who's targeting 16 to 18 year olds because she believes passionately that you don't have to have you know the three a levels in maths and it to be successful in the it channel so she is targeting 16 year olds straight out of school to create like a nurturing development space in her business to then put them through the apprenticeship and then introduce them to her clients and see them on their merry way. So it's, I don't, you know, commercially, I do find a lot of businesses are um, unsure on hiring at that slightly younger end, which no, will no doubt affect the uptake on apprenticeship apprentices at that, at that level. Hmm. Okay. I was just really trying to figure out, I mean, you know, through the, through the high school, what we call high school um, track and, and what what happened when you developed more T-level um, uh, that they just didn't choose. How did you choose? I mean, how did they choose that? Was there, you know, any polling or information from students on what they wanted to follow? Because oh. I think you're uh-huh. right. Crystal clear and why we're doing this and that students mainly then parents and teachers have to be bought in yeah i, I and if they're I, not yeah look I, I i mean i think there's going to be uh you know phd thesis written on you know the disaster that's t-levels um as a policy it's a good example of where you know you've got a very influential figure lord david Sa- sainsbury you know who really is very enamored with the germanic continental system the trouble is that debate about tracking our young people in high school into either academic routes or vocational routes happened at about the same time. You, you know, you guys had this in the early 1900s when you were building your education system. And, you know, our respective countries took a decision not to follow Bismarck's Germany and essentially from 11 onwards track. I mean, we actually did for a while yes. try to do that. after the 1944 Education Act. Uh, you know, we had the tripartite system of um uh, so-called grammar schools and secondary modern which were sort of high schools and then technical schools but the whole policy collapsed in the 1960s so you know there's been a degree of trying to recreate this model that obviously works very successfully in Switzerland and Germany you know there's acceptance amongst parents that okay their kids aren't destined for university in Switzerland um, they know that their kids are going to get a good high school education, which will include the liberal arts, uh, but will but they'll also get you know a fantastic paid apprenticeship at the end of it, which is why in Switzerland, what you know, 60-70% of the youth cohort go into paid apprenticeships. Um, so you know, I I think the policy ambition here was right. You know, we want to be more like our continental cousins in terms of high quality technical education. The trouble is the way in which we went about designing that upper secondary offer. And then in, importantly, you know, it, it hasn't really lasted sort of two seconds with reality in terms of it assumed that just because 50 percent were going through the pure academic A-level route, that the other 50 percent would just fall into line and want to go through these occupational T-level routes. In reality, I think what most young people want is a combination of academic, vocational they want to keep their options open still um, for as long as possible, which includes obviously potentially still going to university, but could include going straight into work via uh, an apprenticeship. And again, what's fascinating when you look at the data here in England at the moment on um, what's happening to our admissions and participation in universities, 
we're actually seeing a big in, a big uptick in the numbers of from lower socioeconomic groups going to university. But conversely, we're seeing middle class, higher socioeconomic groups not going to university. And it's one of the reasons why um, you know the Financial Times ran a big piece about a year or so ago, uh, which I think you know, the headline was um, uh, you know the middle class grab on apprenticeships. Now, of course. In the UK, when we say middle class, it's not, not the same as, you know, you use it in your policy discourse. We mean relatively well off, uh, well off sort of professional background uh, type of households. And so, you know, we're almost seeing a flip here where, uh, you know, for years we've been going on about the importance of going into higher education and more and more working class people are doing that. But conversely, more and more middle class people are, are opting for the degree apprenticeship. In other words, they don't want to leave college with debt. They want to get paid from day one and they still want to leave with a credential at the end of it to keep mm -hmm. mum and dad happy. That, that is very good information. I appreciate it. I'm sorry that I'm taking, but it this is fascinating. And you said there's a decrease also in 25 and under. Yeah, thirty-eight percent decrease in uh, apprenticeship starts. Yeah, you yeah. said twenty-eight or thirty-eight. Um, let me just check actually. Uh, on on here, I think it's thirty-eight. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm, I've taken up a lot of time, and I know Jim has questions, but this is um, very good for us to know, as far as you know choice available and and marketing etc i appreciate it thank you thank you senator yeah thank you a um, couple things one is if only two percent of the kids in the 16 to 19 cohort are going to equivalent to community college and if 50 percent are going to the university track that's that's essentially what you said tom yeah so so i mean i've got just the exact um yeah it's probably best to talk in numbers rather than percentages so that's me know, yeah so 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 the cohort in any one year that's graduating at 18 uh is yeah. is, uh, is about half a million is five hundred thousand, and okay. we have um uh you know, actually, sorry, it's over. It's about one point two million um, okay. in terms of that cohort size. Um, last year we had seventy seven thousand. Seventy seven thousand were on um, were on the youth apprenticeship track, but that wasn't in a single year, right? Because it depends on the um, uh, you know the length of the program. It has to be a minimum thirteen months. It can be anything up to twenty four months. But you know, the apprenticeship data I've got in front of me for the last. And these are in academic years. That's how we measure the data. There were seventy-seven thousand on program, but just to give you a, a, a seventy-seven thousand, seventy-seven thousand youth apprenticeship. Yeah, apprenticeship. under nineteen. Yeah, under nineteen. But right, okay, just to give you a sense of where that was then in 2015, 2016 academic year, we had one hundred and thirty-one thousand that were on youth apprenticeship right. tracks. So, so, so it just gives you a sense of the right. It's gone down. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. What I'm trying to get my head around, though, is I'm talking about the whole cohort. So yeah. about half of them are on the university track. Yeah, yeah, fifty percent. Okay. And about two, and about two percent are on the community college track. No, um, and there'll be a lot more on the community college track in terms of community college courses, or indeed, you know, um, training courses operated by. I was just purely talking about you know the equivalent of our registered apprenticeship, youth apprenticeship program. That two percent informal apprenticeship. This is what I'm confused about. <clears throat> I thought you said that the technical education plan that this former uh, cabinet member was pushing, that what you call the T. T level, yeah. T level. Yeah. I thought that was 2%. No, what percent are, are, are T level? Yeah, so on T levels, it's between 3 and 4% of the cohort that's gone into okay. T level. Okay, okay. So it's 3 and 4%. Yeah on T level and it's like two percent apprenticeship right yeah yeah so in total around about six percent are in um some kind one of or the other i got yeah, it but we're yeah. going with this does that mean essentially what sophie said the rest of them are either just working or just unemployed 
So we've got um, 900,000 that are not in education, employment, training. That's that's under 24. So in broad terms, we're looking at, you know, 50 percent will be in a cohort going on to higher education. Uh, about another 30 percent will be going after level three, a level equivalent, will be going straight into the labor force. Um, some will be on apprenticeships, as we've discussed, and the rest will be not in education, employment or training. I mean, we've got a youth unemployment rate of about 11 percent at the moment. So it's about three times the adult youth unemployment rate. Um, but why it's just right. quite tricky to measure from a methodological point of view is because, you know, we don't allow, for example, 17 year olds uh, to claim unemployment benefit. Um, so you know we can't we can't measure it that way. So that's why we need it. You know we have a participation measure, um, which is an estimate. I think of uh, okay. I, I understand. No, I, I'm, I'm trying to make compared to the United States. I mean, the United States only about sixty percent of high school graduates start college. So forty percent don't. Hmm. Um, very few right now go into apprenticeships. So basically, mo the, the, most of the forty percent are either going right to work or are not going right to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to compare it that way. Yeah. So the and second question is. Sophie's very helpfully, by the way, put, put the data in the chat so you can use that. Oh, uh, good. Your analysis. Yeah. Thank you for that, Sophie. That's all right. So, so, it, so it sounds pretty similar to the United States, not dramatically different in terms of what kids actually do at that age. Yeah. <laughs> the second question I had was, the reason, oh, I mean, the question mark at the end of this, am I right that the reason the percentage of younger people going into apprenticeships um, during this past nine years or whatever it is, is the government changed what was funded? That's essentially what happened, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is why, you know, I'm always keen to stress there's not one particular reason why we've seen the decline in starts. I mean, I, again, in terms of lessons learned about big, uh, big reforms, uh, whether it's to apprenticeships or to secondary education, I think, and I don't know whether you agree with this or not. I mean, it, you know, in 2016, 2017, the government did two things at once. It phased out the old apprenticeship standards and programs, and it introduced a whole new fi um, financial way of paying for it. So they essentially hit employers with what I would call a double whammy. You know, they <coughs> right employers, you know, you've you've got to start getting used to using these different apprenticeship standards products from what you were using before. Oh, and by the way, you know, the way it's all going to be paid for and how it's going to be accounted in the system will also change pretty much overnight. So um those two things coming coming in at the same time uh didn't help. And indeed the data reflects this because you see the number of starts really fall off a cliff after after 2016 2017 you also have we've also you know apprenticeships i go through this with the clients that i meet when i'm sitting in front of their leadership teams who aren't familiar with apprenticeships and they've been around for a really really long time i think it's like a third of boys leaving school at the end of the second world war went on to do an apprenticeship but people were typically badly paid badly treated there were poor working environments overworked underpaid so they got a really bad reputation and it was quite hard to shake off and yeah. so you know and then we had a government that said oh go on apprenticeships they're great but then you had all this feedback and word of mouth people weren't engaging and then they've done their best to standardize them over the years but actually one minute the government's saying, no, let's all go and get degrees. That's brilliant. We're going to introduce, now we want vocational courses as T-levels, actually keep doing an apprenticeships. Now let's focus on them. Oh no, actually everybody go back to university. That's the best way to get. So people have kind of been flip-flopped around for ages. Employers never really fully understood what apprenticeships were. And then they just suddenly told everyone they were going to start taxing them for the privilege of engaging with apprenticeships that nobody was engaged with in the first place. So they never really got the kind of, great hurrah that they deserved because I've seen some incredible you know some incredible stories I've met some incredible people and often when I'm with businesses and I say who in here has got experience with apprenticeship apprenticeships I guarantee some one leader will put their hand up and say I was an apprentice so there are some really great success stories that I don't think have been sung around sung about very often so mm. I think all this contributes to this uptake that sometimes you get flurries of activity and my experience I've got businesses who are really engaging with it this is part of their people plan I've got one client who reports to the board 
each month how they are utilizing that levy fund because it's just a pot of money that's not being used to train people up in their business while you've got people leaving you've got people disengaged and cultural problems so some businesses have apprenticeships kind of built in and embedded in their dna for various reasons whereas we've got some who still aren't even aware of the opportunity or aware of these taxes or aware of how it all works so it's very difficult to talk um on behalf of everyone when actually if from meeting to meeting i have very different conversations with clients and apprentices and different levels of uptake that said clearly these foundation apprenticeships as yet to be fully worked through is an attempt by this new government to try and recalibrate and reorientate the apprenticeship model in england towards younger definitely and already yeah. if you are an sme and you don't pay the levy but you hire someone between the ages of 16 to 21 then you get full 100 percent funding whereas if you hire someone over the age of 21 you get 95 percent. so there's yeah. already an incentive to hire at that time i yeah. think it's then the wraparound care of how you take someone straight out of school mm. um and i think the challenge with that again is what you're what we see come out of school now is very different to probably when we were all at school because they're digital natives. They've been brought up with technology. They are much more familiar and forward thinking. So businesses, I've seen some incredible presentations of school leavers and college leavers going in for interview who were, you know, absolutely amazing. And as Tom alluded to, people are leaving and saying, I don't want to go to university. I don't want the debt. I want to stay living at home, for example, where I can not have to start paying rent. I want to start earning, getting onto the wheel and build my career, continue developing in a commercial environment. And so I think it's, it is starting to pivot. Whereas before, I think by default, it was university. Whereas yeah. now we see a lot of people come through who are specifically wanting an apprenticeship. My goddaughter just wants to go on an apprenticeship. She's really into STEM and wants to kind of get involved in the more technically minded things than go to university. And indeed, even in uh, the US, we saw in the Wall Street Journal, was it a few weeks ago, an article about Gen Z and the tool belt generation. So there's a, you know, there's, there appears to be movements on, uh, on both sides of the pond. I don't know if there's any more questions. I had a couple of uh, reflections I wanted to share with you about, about the commission's work, but maybe there's other questions, um, Sarah, that, that, that people want to ask. Oh. I th Senator, did you have another question? Yeah, yeah, I, I did. Just to, to summarize, and this is something I know, so I know the answer to this question, but just for everybody else's benefit, Tom. It was 20 years ago, plus or minus, when, or 25 years ago, when, the UK decided to go big into apprenticeships. Is that a fair description? Yeah, yeah. In the in the late nineties, um, the Conservatives well, like, yeah, brought in modern apprenticeships. They rebranded them to get away from the nasty craft apprenticeships that Sophie was talking about. That those people got on after the war. So yeah, there was a big rebrand in the mid nineties, and about right. seventy thousand in total at that point were on uh, were on apprenticeship. Yeah, and then it got up to a high of what? How many? Yeah, it got up to. Eight eight hundred thousand. Uh, you know, this is the stock of apprenticeships in uh, uh, in twenty ten. Um, there's some debate about whether they were quality apprenticeships or not, but there was a very high level. Um, so you know, a, a huge huge um, increase, um, and that was for a combination of reasons. In part because um, you know the government obviously at the time before the levy was funding these off the job training out of general taxation. You've got a very uh, innovative, I'm not just saying that because Sophie's uh, on the line from Apprentify, but we've got a very rich tapestry of, of uh, independent organisations, some are for-profit, some are non-profit, who really do that selling and organising of, of apprenticeships. So that obviously helped drive the numbers and drive the market. I mean, in effect, I mean, we don't call it this, but, you know, there's really a, a, a sort of payment by results model really we have around apprenticeship you know if you set up in business you have to be a registered apprenticeship provider uh you're regulated therefore by the state uh, but it's then down to your own innovations your own entrepreneurial effort to go out there and meet with the employers and persuade them to take on apprentices i mean so that, that's what you do uh, and, and your team on a day in day out basis um so that is a you know that's a feature jim as you know that's a that's a big feature of our of our system 
you know, we've we've hit some choppy waters in more recent years for all the reasons that we've gone into. But I I put that down to a lack of clarity about what we were wanted to do with the youth cohort, other than the clarity we had about, which has always been there for three decades at least, about 50% going into uh, the higher education track. Um, and you know, now it falls to this government to sort of come up with this more plurality of opportunity that leads to good rewarding careers and skilled roles. Frankly, whatever track individuals decide is best for them. I mean, that's really the, that's the end state. That's 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 the outcome. I think, in policy terms, we want to reach here. Right, but just to, to summarize, the way the UK got from the mid nineties, <clears throat> excuse me, to two thousand ten, growing apprenticeships by like ten times, hmm. was a combination of government public investment in the training, because it's 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 training like any other education and creating this infrastructure of uh, intermediaries and training providers uh, of a variety of kinds who actually do exactly what Sophie does. And that's the essence of it, right? That's how you got yeah, from yeah, it. Yeah. 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 They, they also created KSBs, which stands for Knowledge, Skills and Behaviours. And so there's also competencies and duties. So if somebody talks to me and says, we want to engage with apprenticeships, I've got someone in IT that I want to put on an IT level three, the first thing I have to do is get a copy of the job description to check that the apprenticeship is aligned to their role. And then that would tell us that they can evidence what they're learning. And then the apprenticeships will also focus on the knowledge, the skills and behaviors that are agreed centrally as the outcomes and kind of the standards for those programs. So when they formalized them and provided the structure and relaunched them, it meant that the quality was therefore controlled and businesses like Apprentify were able to write material aligned to those competencies, duties, knowledge, skills and behaviours and kind of add a bit of cherry on top and a bit of extra seasoning um, to then kind of drive that engagement. But we also have a sales team who are going out proactively knocking on businesses' doors right. saying, get involved with apprenticeships. Yeah. And that was one of the reflections I just wanted to share with you, Senator Rosebeth, and with other commission members uh, and with the um, with the secretariat. And, and by the way, just to, to say, I mean, on the whole story of England's apprenticeship expansion, I think you were there in the room, actually, in 2017, when I gave the speech to the Urban Institute. I wrote a pamphlet, actually, on England's apprenticeship expansion. But I'll, I'll make sure, Sarah, you get a, a copy of that after this call, because it was specifically written for an American audience and it and it tells that story, including shows the, you know, shows the data um, and the growth. Um, but um one of the reflections that you know I had sort of after reading the some of the commission's outputs was around this uh kind of key issue of what is the overall policy objective here for those who in Maryland in the upper secondary system do not for whatever reason go through want to go through uh, the traditional four-year college route and and that's why the comment that Sophie's making about knowledge skills and behaviors I think is is quite important because you know apprenticeship is still I mean it's just basically a form of education but it's delivered in the workplace and off the job um, and I think you know coming back to this t-level story in the end you know there has to be from a this is from a policymaker's perspective a very clear narrative about what are the benefits of this vis-a-vis -vis for all its faults, you know, the tried and tested, I'll just do the four-year college route, I'll just get a load of debt. And 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 that's why being able to define, you know, the the educational uh, outcomes for individuals who who take a work-based route is quite important. I think also it's about, you know, persuading, as we know for this particular age group, parents as well, who, you know, will be some of them anyway, uh, will be quite suspicious of initiatives that look like they're trying to park kids into just low paid or dead end jobs. You know, it all sounds very good. Let's get more of our high school um, cohort into youth apprenticeships. So I think there has to be some work around, not just as Sophie's saying, around, you know, really um, categorizing what that work based curriculum looks like, ensuring it's really good quality but also giving a sense of what are the career progression routes for someone who's going through that youth apprenticeship track. Because one of, I think, you know, and this is, I mean, 
you know, because Sophie and I are trying to be quite frank and open with you about some of the challenges around the English apprenticeship model. But just to flip that for a moment and say, one of the real positives, I think, of our model, which is, in my view, even better than, than the Germanic systems, is that we have at least created a, a qualifications framework which applies as much to the academic sphere as it does to the work-based routes. And it is possible through our apprenticeship model now to start a level two when you leave high school, say as a nursing assistant, and go all the way up to a degree apprenticeship and a nurse without ever having to formally step into an institution and be seen as a classroom-based academic student. I think that's an incredibly powerful model and it and it points the way to a future whereby you know more more young people will themselves opt to go through that route it may still end up with a bachelor degree qualification great if that's the right uh, outcome for them but the fact we have a model that enables that in other words there isn't an artificial glass ceiling in our apprenticeship model and you might want to think about that in terms of progression opportunities for those in the upper secondary track in in Maryland, that, that they can see a future from the shop floor to the boardroom, albeit via this apprenticeship model, rather than necessarily the traditional four-year college route. That makes sense. Thank you. Tom, did you have any other um, reflections or is, I just wanna okay. make sure, okay. Yeah. Any commission members have any other questions or comments for our speakers? No one else does. I have one, and just for everyone's benefit. We, we, we asked the same question with the Australians and with the Swiss. So <laughs> big picture, what occupations are the big three or four of apprenticeships in the UK? If you're ranking, where are most of the apprentices? What are they doing? What are the occupations? In terms of now or in terms of some of the future demand uh, we're doing? No, now. I mean, in, in yeah. real, what's going on in real life or what's yeah. going on? It's, it's difficult. I was going to say it's really job. difficult to answer that because you've got junior level childcare workers, junior level nurses, and then you've also got right the way through to people doing strategic degree apprenticeships. So it's very, very hard to say which one is the most kind of popular you've obviously got a huge amount in social and healthcare because it's a great way of developing people who maybe as um, someone's already mentioned not necessarily academic but you could be an incredible nurse that learns on the job and work your way through the system brilliantly um i have just done a quick google for you and you've got business administrator so that's like a business admin type apprenticeship that's level two or level three kind of low level office job in the background, getting stuff done. But from there you can progress onto level fours or move into a specialism. Data analyst and data technician are some of the most popular. So I've touched on data and businesses are all talking about it. So there's a huge area there. Um, it is very, very hard. What I could say is that about half of the apprenticeships are level three and level fours, which are the junior early careers space. So they are they are targeted. Sorry, you can ask a question. Well, I'm trying this, the level stuff. I say this. I've said this to some. Your levels, I never can keep track of. I'm, I'm what I'm trying to understand is what kind of work are they doing? Are they in agriculture? Are they in healthcare? It's low, there's six hundred and fifty types of apprenticeship. I know that. And that's what I'm trying to say. Which which yeah. are the big buckets? So, yeah, yeah. So if you look at the um, yeah, if you look at the stock of apprenticeships we've got, um, and indeed, you know, Sophie's already mentioned. I think you know, the top sectors they are in areas like health, social care, construction is big, education, yeah. and and actually, what's quite fascinating. And again, you know, I mean, I'll I'll, I'll share the links. I think it'd be probably helpful for commissioners to to look at the. Yeah, there's a website with, that lists all the different apprenticeship programs, uh, you know, the 600 mm -hmm. plus of them. And mm -hmm. and also uh, in the presentation that I shared with the Oxford uh, group, there is a, a very helpful guide to the levels, Jim. So you'll be able to see that as well. <laughs> so Playing right from level one um, to level eight. But what Sophie was just um, pointing to there is that, you know, um, a lot of actually um, the apprenticeships are at so-called sub-degree level or what you would call associate degree level you know you do these kind of two-year um, uh, uh, associate degrees what i thought was fascinating actually i don't say you caught up with this but the last few days there's been a major report from a new body that the, the new government set up called skills england which looked at the three top sectors where there were critical demand 
skill shortages. And I thought what was fascinating about those three was that two, well, well, they were basically health, social care and construction were the three where we've got manifest skill shortages. Now, obviously, this is more relevant to the debate in, in Britain than it is in the US where you've got private health care uh, model. Um, but, you know, the employer, uh, you know, the employer in the context of these two areas that are in critical demand, it, you know, is the government of one kind or another, right? So in some ways, you know, the, the government itself is the biggest laggard when it comes to solving its own skill shortages. And again, that raises then a question, I think, for policymakers, the extent to which you can use the power of, of public policy and public procurement to drive uh, behaviour even within your own public sector. I mean, I, you know, I thought the... Um, executive order that President Biden signed in the last few months about federal state employees is an interesting development because it's essentially the chief executive of the country saying we need to take on more apprentices or is it apprentices? Uh, you know, you could see that uh, happening at a state level as well. Um, you know, there's the power of public sector procurement as well, you know, in terms of in if there are big contracts to be let, whether that's with construction firms or other types of um, suppliers and providers, you can, you know, under contract law, you can put a proviso in there that they uh, take on a certain number of apprenticeships. So all of that, I think, helps the public sector drive, you know, drive the ambition. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got to also have the employers uh, to to take the apprentices on. Thank you. Well, I think that's it then. Thank you so much um, to our speakers today, Tom and Sophie. I uh, really appreciated the information you supplied and thought it was. I hope it was really helpful for the commission members. Um, commission, me mem commission members will be meeting again tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. to hear about apprentices in Germany. Um, and Tom, I will forward your presentation to the commission members as well. Thanks all. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Take care, bye-bye. Thanks, Sophie.